Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to um, our latest webinar in our series. We have a very special guest with us um, this afternoon. Um, remember that you can always pose questions to our guests by putting them in the YouTube chat, um, and then I'll forward them to our guests and our two moderators in the studio. So um, I'll give a quick introduction to our speaker, and then I will tell you about your moderators. So. Our speaker for today is um, YB Datasri Anwar Ibrahim. You all know he's the leader of Malaysia's uh, Pakatan Harapan Coalition and also president of the People's Justice Party. He was our deputy prime minister from 1993 to 1998 and also finance minister from 1991 to 1998. Since 1998, he has led the reform movement to strengthen democracy and the rule of law in our country. For his principal stand on issues of justice and the rule of law, he has spent over 10 of the last 20 years in solitary confinement as a prisoner of conscience. During this time, he has also written and lectured extensively on topics including good governance, human rights, political reform, and has held teaching positions at Oxford University, good choice, John Hopkins University, and Georgetown University. Our first moderator is Mark Disney. Many of you know him well. And we were just saying, actually, he um, interviewed Dato Sri back in January 2014 as well. Mark studied English at St. Edmund Hall in Oxford and has worked in publishing and journalism as well as now teaching. He's currently deputy head of the sixth form at College Tungu Jaffa, and he is especially focused on the wider academic enrichment. He's moderated many of our events for the Oxford Society and other venerable institutions such as LSE. He's also a past president of the Oxford Chemistry Society of Malaysia and sits on our EXCO at the moment. Your other moderator is Balraj Panu. He read law at Keeble College, Oxford. After a stint as a solicitor in London and Hong Kong, he gave up the fast city life to become an entrepreneur, principally in the medical and wellness field. His latest project is a COVID-19 deep cleaning venture. He's a past vice president of the Oxford and Cambridge Society in Malaysia and also sits on our EXCO committee. So I'd like to welcome um, YB Datasri Amwar Ibrahim, Mark and Balraj. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, and uh, yeah, welcome uh, welcome uh, back to the Oxford Society, Datasri. We're uh, delighted that you've made a uh, uh, time in your schedule. I know uh, there's a lot of people uh, uh, clamoring for your attention right now, so thank you very much. Uh, could we kick off? Uh, the question that everybody wants to uh, know um, is that because COVID has kicked everything off the news cycle, um, uh, even people who watch Malaysian politics quite closely seem to be confused as to what exactly is going on right now. Could you give us an update, a scorecard perhaps, on, on the state of Malaysian democracy right now? Um, it is uh, regrettable that the image of political leadership is at the lowest ebb. Um, the uh, politics about this power play of the uh, elite grabbing for power positions, ministerial positions and GLC positions. Uh, but that's of course not the entire case, the entire truth. Some of us still strongly believe and advocate the fall. And, um, and, and uh, in that uh, sense, uh, we are concerned about the state of affairs. Uh, this is uh, quite fluid. Um, the, um, as you know, the ruling coalition lacks legitimacy and therefore they lack the courage even to convene a proper session of parliament. And um, notwithstanding, there must be efforts and we continue to uh, discuss uh, measures, um, put um, um, some thought, serious consideration among uh, responsible members of parliament to see the interests of the nation and the future of this country. Thank you. Baraj, over to you. Um, Dr. Sri, maybe we can break the discussion up a little bit. Um, the discussion perhaps could be framed in that what has happened, what is happening, and perhaps what should happen. And there's uncertainty, as Mark said, in every aspect of this. I think never before, usually politics would dominate the first, second, third page of the newspapers. Currently, COVID did, you know, just takes over the entire spectrum. There has been a lack of understanding, a lack of clarity as to what happened 
pretty much uh, you know, after the Sheraton move, uh, pretty much before COVID, what's happening, what's happening today, and what can happen in the future. So with, with that kind of framework, and please feel free to choose uh, which one you would like to focus on, I, I wanted to focus on one of the, the big elephant in the room in Malaysian politics. The elephant in the room in Malaysian politics is coalition politics. The coalition politics uh, determine Barisan National, it determines the function of Pakatan, it determines, I think, very strongly the position of uh, Perikatan National as well. So let's dig deep into this. Let's dig deep. Let's see, you know, if you imagine it, politics is a team sport and uh, these are the football players, the internal dynamics, you know, they determine the success of the team. What is your report card, firstly, on Perikatan National? Secondly, what about Pakatan Harapan? You know, it's not that it's going all too well. So coalition politics, Perikatan and Pakatan, what are your thoughts before, during and after maybe? In a multiracial country setting like ours, coalition politics is certainly understandable. Uh, in in, in um, probably even necessary. The issues uh, of concern is whether it is just a power game, a play between political leadership, or based on certain clear fundamental principles. Um, Pakatan Harapan and uh, prior to that, Pakatan Rakyat uh, was a set of coalition with clear manifesto, clear agenda. Uh, this cannot be true for Perikatan National because there's just coalition of people grabbing power. I mean, it's not just a Shaitan move, it's an uh, act of treachery, irresponsible, uh, no set agenda. They are not uh, neither committed to either reform or democracy or good governance. It's just uh, having an opportunity to sh share the perks and, um, and, and continue to govern. Um, so I think um, Pakatan Harapan, as it stands, um, DAP Amanah and Kaadilan is committed to the reform agenda. Yes, we tried in the last two years, almost two years, uh, to, to uh, implement. Uh, there were setbacks, of course, but uh, at least there's a clear direction uh, where the country is heading. Um, I would say that uh, we are not fully in control because um, uh, Tun Mahathir still uh, was a pivotal figure in that coalition, um, although it's considered to be transient. But then uh, uh, the uh, initial Pakatan Harapan agenda is certainly not um, something that we, I could say, um, frankly, um, fully satisfied. Because we did try, we did attempt, but there were lots of constraints. Um, uh, we were very uh, gung-ho about uh, attacking corruption of the past administration, 1MDB, etc. But I thought we should have been as strong and formidable against excesses and corrupt practices within the present administration or the then administration. And that I've said publicly in the past. I mean, uh, Data Sri, I mean, it's interesting you, you uh, bring, bring that up. Um, a lot of people are wondering, uh, at what point before the Sheraton move did you and the Pakatan leadership know that there were, uh, that, that treason was brewing in the ranks? Um, it seemed to take everybody by surprise. It, can that really be the case? Well, politics in this sense is a concept of the rich and the powerful. And um, uh, this was not uh, something which came as a surprise to us. I was aware of it at least uh, six months prior to that because um, elements within my party uh, working to persuade uh, AMNO MPs and some AMNO MPs did confide with me um, to suggest that we, uh, they are looking for this uh, formula uh, forward to them, uh, which uh, means that um, they want to, to, to form a government uh, of mainly Malays. We, we should come back. This country has somewhat um, alienated the majority of the Malays. We have seen in a series of by-elections and the results. Um, and then they say the only solution is to make sure that uh, the Malay uh, supremacist agenda comes to play. I was persuaded uh, notwithstanding the um, treachery by some of my party members, but I was persuaded by many in the AMNO and in Bersatu, saying that, look, Anwar, um, you should uh, join force. So it is not something new, but I made it very clear. And my, my standard argument is that, look, I went down to campaign for, yes, the 
um, Malay dominance is still there by virtue of our population, our constitution, uh, and the legacy. But then um, this is a, a new Malaysia. And I said, yeah. even in, in Port Dixon, um, the 10% Indian uh, voters, 90% of them, the voters, supported me, or 80% of the Chinese, 60 mm -hmm. over percent of the Malays. How do then I come out with a position or statement now to say that my concern is the welfare of the Malays? So that was brewing. I have uh, engaged many times with uh, PH uh, leaders who were quite aware of this. I even uh, confided many times, in many occasions, you know, I have virtually every week or fortnight meeting with Tun Mahathir and, 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 and uh, su uh, suggested he should be really firm in his position to reject that sort of uh, uh, attempt by people around uh, or within the cabinet uh, working against the interests of our Pakatan Harapan agenda. Mm. Can, 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 um, sorry, Baraj, before you come in with your next question, can I just skip very quickly to, uh, it was a, a question lower down on the list that we had, which links to what you were saying, which is that many people argue that in Malaysia, uh, democracy as in a, a Western style democracy is not possible because of the deep state. Okay, the deep state is a term that's become very current, I, I guess, in the last two, three, four years. Um, in Malaysia, when we talk about the deep state, it's generally viewed as an alliance between predominantly the Malay elite and Islamist forces or is, uh, Muslim forces in this country. Um, how do you see the deep state? Because this particular incident to a lot of people uh, seems to indicate that, yes, you know, it, it, it is the deep state machinations that have resulted in the current um, impasse. Uh, Mark, this narrative has been brewing since the 50s. Mm. You look at the politics mm. in the 50s and the 60s, is always about um, the survival of the Malays. Um, and rightly so, some of the concerns, economic concerns, education, um, uh, health. And I, I share that. I grew up in that uh, setting. I uh, fully appreciate and understand. And it takes um, a clear policy on the part of the government. Not through a racial uh, sort of an agenda, but uh, a transparent policy um, to, help, to help those um, poorer segments of the community and the vast majority of the Malays. So that uh, uh, seemed to be um, the major concern. But instead of saying this, they take um, upon uh, themselves to um, project an entirely uh, racial sort of uh, agenda. And, and I think um, the issue of deep state, of course, is there. I mean, racist, racism is there. Um, I mean, not only among the Malays, but also Chinese Indians. Uh, you, you, you give them some opportunity uh, or, or leverage to try and assist at the expense of others. But here you're talking about uh, the role of uh, government and issue of governance that must be uh, clearly, manifestly just and transparent. Um, issue of deep state, um, the, again, uh, like, like new normal, it becomes a cliche. I mm. remember one of the most um, outspoken uh, PH leaders then who talked about um, deep state happens to be one of the players <laughs> in the deep state. And, right. and then uh, a, a who, minister. Who is that? Which one are we talking about? <laughs> It is quite clear. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think um, uh, we should go beyond that. This has been the narrative and the rhetoric uh, in the last five decades. We must mature as a democracy. You start. You you, you must engage uh, the people. Uh, yes, I think uh, the Pakatan Harapan government at that time probably uh, was a bit too confident and did not address this issue that they have to really uh, appease the concern of the Malays. I've appealed to them many times. I haven't raised these issues in parliament, but I thought the leadership then thought, well, they can handle. And when I saw this uh, uh, I mean, disastrous defeat in the series of by-elections, the blame goes to the DAP mm -hmm. and the Chinese. Uh, to the contrary, we should take the portion of the plate that is to make sure to, that our programs do cater for the plight uh, of the majority who are poor and underprivileged. And with this COVID-19 issue uh, crisis, 
you actually see uh, how it has exacerbated the whole issue of poverty and inequality in this country. Um, but again, our position, my, my position personally, because they say because of this position, I've lost some base of Malay support. But I say, look, I mean, uh, uh, we must um, uh, ensure that this country protect the interests of the majority of the Malays, but this country must also be a country that caters uh, and, and defend the right of every single citizen, regardless of race. And it's this a, must a, be the new reality. It's a very difficult uh, tightrope to walk, isn't it, uh, in Malaysia uh, between, between those two things. You got a lot of criticism right at the start for these don't spook the Malays comment when you were down in, in Johor. And uh, uh, from I think from the more liberal progressive um, uh, wing that, that essentially the, the urbanites who voted in uh, uh, Pakatan back you know, two years ago. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, Balraj, you, you have a, a question for Dato yeah. Sri. So, Dato I want to just pick you up on this point, and this is pre-Sheraton. Uh, as much as what the other side was doing, there were activities within Pakatan Harapan that led to the problems that we're having. And you, you, you mentioned some of this, uh, you know, and the, the overconfidence perhaps. And there, was, there were traffic lights, right? There were red lights that the by-elections, there, there was a lot of grumbling. Um, so th th there were some weaknesses there. And if you don't mind me asking, in, in the spirit of um, you know, improving, what kind of report card would you give from a 0 to 10 uh, to the major players of Pakatan Harapan that led to what actually happened with you know, recently Sheraton and so on and so forth? What I mean, look at the, uh, looking at the bigger picture, Make uh, the, uh, you must con uh, accept the fact that the change was quite phenomenal. Not only the elections, but also uh, the issue of governance, um, the 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 setting up of uh, somewhat more independent institutions, um, anti-corruption commission, um, judiciary. Although I wouldn't say objectively that uh, they are truly independent in the context of a true reform, but there were efforts. Um, but of course, criticisms are valid, even the Anti-Corruption uh, Commission, uh, more selective, they go after the past, past uh, leaders, but the present leaders are somewhat uh, protected and guarded. Uh, even cases where there were clearly ostentatious living styles, expense, uh, you know, and, and, and that uh, was picked up. And many of our diehard supporters, those who genuinely believe in reform, thought that this is a flaw, um, that we are not able to uh, fulfill that sort of a commitment. Uh, and then, but of course, we, we, we also inherit somewhat a, a semi-rotten uh, system uh, with a huge debt and uh, poor governance and uh, um, Issues of you know, and, uh, lack of transparency, those are tenders, etc. And these need to be corrected. And you must give credit where it is due, because other than some measures in terms of institutional reforms, these um, issues of, of more transparent governance and managing the economy and finances is certainly far better than uh, what it used to be. Although, again, I said I would qualify this because we were a bit stringent. We thought that the, the, the society, the people, the rakyat generally would uh, appreciate, understand, but not necessarily so. Because you go to the ground and meet the fishermen and the farmers, okay, they understand one MDB, uh, Independent Judiciary, Anti Corruption Commission, but they say that, you know, sometimes we get less uh, as compared to before. And this is, of course, a major issue that I think the top leadership probably lacks uh, comprehension because I don't think they were really in touch with the real masses. They were more uh, surrounded by the elites and the usual business uh, conglomerates and cronies. Dr. Sri, I'm gonna, I think this is going to be a central theme because we're getting a lot of interest about the economic situation before economic situation right now and actually the, you know, where it could be with the new normal. So the economic um, discussion I think is crucial. We have also in uh, Oxbridge alumni uh, focused with this with a discussion with Professor Jomo. So this is a central theme that I, you know, we, I think we're going to come back to a few times and um, maybe you should share a little bit with us what you think should have happened, what you think should happen now uh, and what we should be looking forward to in the future because it may not all be the same or it might be the same. 
how would you deal with this central problem the same obsolete or archaic uh, policies must end i mean you look at the economic policy we are stuck to uh, um, gdps and investments etc we we'll, um, seem to have a uh, disconnect in terms of the real fundamental problems in this country agriculture which has been neglected uh, to that extent although we talk about new economic uh, new agriculture policy but there's no clear direction uh, force and policy to um, encourage and uh, um, to embark upon a, a clear uh, agricultural uh, program that would increase uh, enhance substantially the production i'm not talking purely in terms of uh, food security i mean just um, increase production and not to depend on somewhat uh, 52 billion ringgit of import that um, mind you at the same time would uh, um, affect the welfare of the majority of our people who are smallholders farmers fishermen and now, because there is no real reform in this agenda this sector has been somewhat neglected the fishing fishing villages has been somewhat the same in the last 50 years so the inequality that we talk about um some i mean it becomes like uh, populous and rhetoric uh, post piketty uh, more so but then um in terms of real concrete programs does not seem to happen you think in terms of just subsidy and you have people talking about uh the malays are poor because they don't work hard you see the old uh, mindset um colonial mentality of uh, you know looking at the other uh, the colonized uh, mentality is there and, and whereas we should be talking from the days of Onko aziz to jomo is uh, giving them the opportunities uh, that, that's right uh, I, I, I have to interject a little bit uh, as yes. much as i agree with you on few of these things but there is a view that it's not the policy that's an issue in malaysia it's always the execution the execution was lacking let's say felda let's say the other uh, target uh, targeted areas you know they didn't get the results not because the policies were muddled or ineffective but the execution was a problem now they seem to be a problem before but even in the time that Pakatan was in power, would you say the execution was well done? And, and then importantly, in the future, how would you do it differently? I think the flaw is both the policy and the uh, execution. There's always this concern. I mean, most elites feel that the policies are perfectly crafted. I don't share that. For example, even uh, policy of agriculture, policy of dig dig digitalization, policy on education, policy on public health. I mean, we can see now it's quite flawed, all right? Um, don't compare to um, Zimbabwe or Senegal or Chad, but generally, given our capacity, we'll be talking about how the, um, the, the, the performance, the general performance, economic, social uh, um, programs in the last 10 years have somewhat stagnated. Um, and, and I see the need, therefore, to embark on policies that um, would cater again, as I said, uh, you, you mentioned Felda as an example. Okay, the policy Felda seems somewhat the same for the last uh, umpteen years or decades. Yeah. You know, there's no thinking, a new uh, creative thinking in terms of how to embark on a new program, and the welfare the shareholders of the of the Felda settlers come last. So the, there is a <laughs> flawed policy here. You know, uh, and of course, execution becomes disastrous. Everybody wants to get um, some some interest uh, commissions, and and uh, this has gone uh, astray from the uh, stated policy. So, assuming the policy is somewhat better if well executed, okay, that is partly uh, the solution. But certainly, to me, it's not uh, along the solution. You talk about new normal. New normal means not just accepting the present normal but looking at post-normal times which require a, 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 a entirely new creative thinking about how we deal with our economy our health our education now whether the pakatan um, harapan government did execute uh, relatively better i would certainly concede i mean i was there on the ground we see that uh, it's being done but uh, we didn't have time or to, to really really look at the, some of the major policies 
uh, fell down for one. Uh, we, 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 we were concerned about uh, uh, ma making sure that it's more, it's, it's well managed, uh, excesses, uh, stop the excesses. But in terms of formulating a new uh, paradigm, uh, we did not uh, succeed in that sense. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question in, uh, Data Sri, from uh, Halmi um, Azri, who, uh, picking up on what you just said about the uh, the state of the new normal, economically, um, especially democratically, um, I think in, in Malaysia, the issue of democracy, what, what on earth is going on, uh, technology, um, will that um, kind of condemn us to remain as a lower tier developing nation? Uh, so I think the concern is, the, uh, given the political fragility of the of the country, obviously foreign investors are, are looking very closely at, at this. Um, uh, on top of the economic hit that we're going to take, is that going to set back our uh, developmental goals? I think that's uh, Halmi's uh, question. I, I s s clearly I, uh, agree because um, the fragility of the uh, present coalition. Uh, I mean, fragility due to the lack of legitimacy, uh, which is more fundamental to my mind. But this needs to be resolved. And, and I don't think they can um, last. And it would depend on the uh, resolve of Pakatan Narapan and the opposition to come out uh, with a clear plan of action. Otherwise, we'll have to deal with it during the elections, which hopefully will be sooner. But the end results, of course, uh, because of the, the, the um, fractured sort of a coalition and it's weak and um, we will not be able to uh, attract um, confidence and Im new investments. That's one. Number two, uh, there is no discussion whatsoever to be uh, about post-COVID. No, no. Uh, it is just uh, dealing ad hoc with COVID issues, but I think after a month or so, we should be able to formulate a clear economic uh, program. There's no discussion about, you know, quality education or public health in terms yeah. other than improving it to deal with the COVID issue. Fair, I would support that. In fact, in some of my statements where it is uh, necessary, we do support the uh, government initiative. But we, our concern is again, issue of transparency, of issue of clear policies, and to be able to, 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 to discuss uh, and debate. And, and that is why we've been insisting that we must convene parliament so that it is uh, accountable. And how do you then get accountability? The contracts. Now, the, the decision of the government, which I can understand. No, no time for this long tender process. Fair. But then you are dealing with <laughs> the moral hazard that is three years. Yes. So, so there's a huge moral hazard. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. they must be able to uh, answer uh, leading questions in Parliament. And now uh, the decision is no questions. Yeah. Well, what Parliament. is the state? Sorry. What What is the actual state at the moment? If uh, what What are your uh, sort of operatives telling you in terms of the actual numbers? Uh, I think a lot of us were confused as to how many people actually supported the, the Muyadin government. And, and of course, uh, Malaysian politics is like a complex Venn diagram, right? There's a lot of overlaps. Um, are there people who are kind of wavering on the edges? If, if we had a full parliament, is it possible under the new normal that the government would reform minus a few figures? Um, I believe in transparency. But in these sort of political issues, you become transparent, you are dead. Right. <laughs> Thank you for admitting but the, that. <laughs> but uh, what is clear is that the um, ruling coalition has no courage to convene a parliamentary session, which means they are not prepared uh, to, to at least satisfy not only for the parliament, but also the Malaysian public, that they have the numbers um, to consider themselves as legitimate government that enjoy the support of the majority. Right. Okay. And that, I think, uh, is something positive in so far as the Pakatan is concerned. Okay. Over to you, Baraj. 
Oh, sorry, I am torn because I'm looking at the questions coming and my own thoughts because everybody wants to know about the future. Everybody wants to discuss the economics. But until you are in power, it's difficult for you to maybe say that or deal with it and, and so on. And so one of the issues maybe and what you are saying is, you know, the legitimacy is so weak that it needs to be fixed. Uh, and maybe then I should focus on this topic. Um, one of, if you don't mind me saying, one of your superpowers uh, if I can call it that, has been to pull people from extremely divergent views, you know, complete opposite ends of the political spectrum. You have managed to get them together. They look at each other. They shook hands. There was hugging. You know, it's it's a level five mutant power, I think some would say. So it's fantastic. So would you be able to use this superpower perhaps to reach out to Muidin? Is that potential that the old Pakatan Harapan comes back? Is that a possible? Is it going to be some other animal, political animal? What, what are your thoughts, sir? You know, uh, in, in my political philosophy, um, I never fear to negotiate, to paraphrase John Kennedy. I mean, you do uh, engage, and I, in fact, I had the um, opportunity to meet and discuss with him, uh, but that was merely confined to COVID-19. Um, but, but my concern is, in any sort of an arrangement, um, you talk about people first, the country first, uh, people say it's nonsense unless you set a clear agenda. And I don't think we should uh, clamor for power and position if you do not uh, make it very clear that this country must forge ahead as a mature democracy with a clear reform agenda. And that is, to my mind, fundamental in Pakatan Harapan. I, in fact, in my summer of exchanges, even my colleagues, I always have tend to remind them, you know, Yes, we are politicians, we have to make adjustments and compromises, but uh, don't forget, um, you'll be judged. And, and finally, uh, we must, uh, our, our legitimacy again as a coalition, as government, only when we feel confident that in this new arrangement, we are able to affect change through reform in this country. And for that, I'm prepared, of course, to discuss with anyone who's committed that reform agenda. Okay. Speaking of that, uh, Dr. Sri, we've got a question from uh, Chaco who, who says, will you be pushing for a vote of no confidence once Parliament is properly uh, recommenced? And do you think that political fragility is going to be part of the new normal? Um, fragility is part of the new normal temporarily, hopefully, for the sake of the nation. Uh, whether we um, will um, move uh, this motion of non-confidence, as far as Pakatan Harapan is concerned, um, we have uh, not done so because that was the condition imposed by the parliament, the rules. No new motion, no questions, uh, no sitting except for the king's uh, address, followed by the reading of the first bill, uh, for, uh, the reading of bills for first reading, I'm sorry, um, of the supplementary bills, and the uh, parliament will be adjourned. Um, uh, but notwithstanding that, I think there will be uh, moves by some other MPs to bring it up. And, and um, although I'm not uh, sure how the government will deal with it, but certainly they have made very clear uh, in the circular to MPs, the notice of meeting to the MPs, that this meeting will only deal with the address and um, to, 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 to provide the opportunity for the first reading. And I believe the standing orders will be suspended, not to allow for any questions. So, Dasri, are you going to, what are you going to do about it? Well, I, um, as, as in, the, in the opposition, would have to raise strong objections. Um, but we also understand the present predicament faced by this country. The government will use COVID-19 um, as their main preoccupation. And we, of course, support that. But notwithstanding, since you can open, um, uh, I mean, um, you can continue to play golf these days, there's no reason why you can't have a proper parliament, uh, sitting parliament. Uh, in fact, the speaker has done uh, reasonably well to make sure that the social distancing is uh, adequately observed in parliament, which means that all the um, 
gallery will be used by parliamentarians. And if that's done, why can't we continue to have uh, this week or two weeks sit, uh, sitting? Mm. It, it does seem ridiculous. The rest of the yeah. And, yeah, and I don't believe, given the scenario at present of the Perkata right. National and the, um, as I, you said, fragility, um, um, I, I don't think they would allow us to do that. Right. Dr. Who determines this? I mean, let's take this as a fulcrum. Uh, I think there is a lot of urgency in the people. They want to see action. People want uh, to feel confident in the government and uh, the certain things must happen. But of course, we can understand Parikatan is motivated uh, to delay it perhaps. Um, but who is the decision maker of whether this happens or not? Okay, the government can, can um, uh, move Definitely. because then the order of the day, normally the government order or uh, motion takes precedence. Uh, so even we take a, a move a motion uh, only after uh, um, uh, government business. So that's always been the standard rule. But a normal functioning democracy doesn't seem to be that way. You see, that is just the, the rule. So the prerogative of the speaker, but the speaker is of course dictated by the order um, from the government, not in terms of the right uh, to speak or to address in a normal city. Uh, but in this given sort of uh, situation, that seems to be the case. There was one case in the past where the, um, the, the, the standing orders were suspended. I think Tansi Zahe, during the debate on the amendments to the royal, uh, you know, some of the, yeah, the amendment to the uh, power of the royalty. And uh, it was suspended to allow for members of parliament to... Um, speak uh, without this hindrance of sedition laws, etc. And uh, that was taken as uh, done, uh, which means there is still the discretion of the speaker, uh, but we will certainly object to that, strongly opposed to that. Thank you. Can, can I ask you just back to something uh, uh, Balraj raised earlier, a, a sort of, you know, after May, uh, 2018, huge expectation and all the rest of it. Um, a lot of people would say, well, Pakistan, you know, they had a bite at the cherry, um, uh, they blew it. Um, looking back over the last almost exactly two years, right, or, you know, next week or week after next, it will be the second anniversary of uh, what was for a lot of people a remarkable day, actually. I mean, it was a uh, widespread celebrations around KL for sure. Um, what would you do looking back are there two or three things that you wish you, that you hadn't done uh, and two or three things that you wish you had done in that small window uh, that you guys had to actually implement change um well um i was <laughs> um, I, I i can't share from that responsibility but i was just an ordinary member of parliament um uh, other than the pakata narapan i was uh, never consulted on anything uh, yeah. So I very little say in terms of uh, governance, in issue of governance. Uh, but I would still concede that many of the things done by my colleagues are quite satisfactory. But um, there were, of course, certain priorities, as I said, the issues of uh, uh, poverty and, 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 and appeasing some uh, Malay concerns should have been addressed at that time. And um, going down, I mean, consultation, uh, probably uh, at that time, Tun Mahathir has his limitations, but going down to the Malay masses uh, in villages, in districts, was also essential. That could not uh, happen. Um, but otherwise, I, I don't think you can uh, portion the blame on uh, Pakatan Arapan per se. I mean, uh, we were not consulted with the resignation. Um, and, and um, of course, there was, of course, uh, treachery on the part of some from Basatu and some from Kadilan. That's right. Right. As much as we appreciate that, and I completely agree with you, and I, I want to pick up a question by Gobin Khalsa. Uh, there is a role that you as an individual maybe played um, that that led maybe to other things and you know maybe a butterfly effect, a small action that just got grew and grew and then COVID happened and then boom, you know, you're having a different government altogether. Would, would you think that's possible? What do you think about that? No, I mean, I, I, I uh, did my part. I have, uh, in uh, private, in public, in, uh, in the party, in the coalition, I've always give, said 
uh, notwithstanding some my serious misgivings uh, on the way the uh, government is conducted, I have said we have given the let given uh, Mahade the latitude, the space to run the government uh, with the understanding that he would not renege the uh, promise and the mandate given by the people during the elections. Uh, so I think, um, what else can I do? Um, um, Tun, uh, uh, sorry, Tun has been very quiet uh, of late, or certainly uh, in the media you don't uh, hear too much. Um, who is you know, the de facto and the, perhaps the de jure uh, leader of, of the opposition? I think a lot of people still kind of, you still seem to be almost the eternal opposition uh, uh, leader. Or is Tun still, is he still, when parliament reconvenes, who, who will be take that position? Uh, Pakatan Harapan um, meets regularly and uh, some of our leaders have been assigned to continue to engage with uh, Tun Mahathir and also uh, Tansi Shafi'i, uh, Sri Shafi'i of Warisan. Uh, mm -hmm. So the engagement continues. As you see, um, last week we um, uh, issued the five leaders. So, uh, so that will continue. But in so far as uh, opposition leaders said, I think Pakatan Harapan is quite sad. I think I will continue uh, to function as an uh, opposition leader in parliament. The speaker has been notified. Okay, thank you. Baraj. Um, Dr. Sri, um, it's a changing landscape. This is uh, COVID-19 is a once in a lifetime, hopefully thing, you know, the whole of humanity is going through. And uh, in a lot of places, in a lot of discussions in corporate Malaysia, for example, the, the initiative is to change, to pivot, to move forward, to do what is necessary, to adapt to the new normal. You know, these are the languages that we are familiar with. And in politics, maybe we don't hear the same thing. We're kind of moving backwards. So it's very refreshing to hear what you said just now, that you are determined to do the new, uh, the, you know, make the changes. But do you think the Malaysian uh, stakeholders, so this is a Helmi Azri question uh, from the public, do you think the Malaysian stakeholders, both urban and rural, and the political leaders are willing to shift from the existing policies to move the country forward? Is the ground they, ready? Sorry, Baraj. They gave us the mandate in May 2018, and they expected some change. But of course, um, the, the stark realities in terms of the conservative belt is still there, which we will have to handle. And, and we are able to do it. I mean, I am not um, uh, from the aristocratic uh, or elite uh, background. I come from the village. I grew up and uh, very pronounced my commitment on Bahasa, uh, on Islam as a young youth leader. And, and, and I can continue to engage with them. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm uh, gratified the fact that I, I realize that um, whilst uh, being rooted in this uh, Malay Muslim base, you also realize that the country is only six decades after independence and uh, we must uh, then um, embrace the entire family of Malaysians as one. And if you can continue to engage them in this manner, but and, and also have policies that uh, not, not seem to be uh, disconnect with the grassroots, uh, then we can, to a large extent, change this. Because um, we always apportion the blame that, you know, people are not ready. But what? I, I don't believe that that is so. Of course, racism is very something appealing. Yesterday in the Facebook Live, I commented on two recent books on, on um, the issue of race, so, so, you know, surfacing. Um, even even under these circumstances you see in Europe, you see in, in, in America, it's not something peculiar here. But mm. I then take a lot of pain to explain that Malays as Muslims, you know, the chauvinism, the chauvinistic element in the Malays should be discarded when we embrace Islam. Because Islam uh, places so much importance to issue of, of, of humanity, of justice. So the interpretation must not be allowed and be given to some of these uh, uh, fanatical clerics that would hijack Islam. So, and, and um, that is, uh, again, precisely the reason why I think we need to have the resolve and the leadership and the courage to deal. Otherwise, for the next 50 years, we go back to the same uh, supremacist agenda, and this is not going to help 
politically, economically, and socially in this country. Yeah, I think that that's obviously true, isn't it? And we have a question in actually from someone called Lookman. I better not give his surname. Uh, second name, but um, uh, some people, he says, have been calling for Pakatan to reform, um, putting a halt to the uh, 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 Anwar Ibrahim to Mahathir era and pushing the likes of younger people. Nick Nazmi is a name that gets mentioned, uh, Kian Ming, your daughter gets mentioned, perhaps even some of the more um, reform-minded uh, youngsters on the other side. D do you see uh, a kind of a generational shift uh, in this country, because obviously, you know, we, you know, we have have had the world's oldest prime minister. Um, do you see a, a generation of, of people in their late thirties, forties, uh, coming in and taking a much, much more um, directed role in uh, in Malaysian politics? I totally agree. You see, if it is in Kandilan, the brain of new leadership uh, from Nick Nazmi to. Sim Sassin to Chen Chung to Klee Ka, I mean, so many of them can line up. They were given very prominent positions in the either the select committees of parliament or in, in party positions, um, heading communications, uh, information, strategy committees, are all young leaders. And I think they should be given the, the opportunity then, um, to, 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 and also because of the, the generational sort of view Gen Y, so they ought to be able to shift the discussion. These younger leaders are more confident in, in, in promoting this sort of a reform and Malaysian agenda uh, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, the old faces finally, you got like, look at my old colleagues in, in, in government mm -hmm. and, and now shifted the other side with those in the 60s and 70s and the 80s and 90s. Finally, they say, ah, oh, no, 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 no. And these are finally a, a Malay problem, the Malay tick, <laughs> must tick chart. I mean, it yeah. is poor governance, it is a corruption, it is cronyism, it is a abuse of power. That is the problem, that you neglect the um, and, and ignore the plight of the poor. I mean, this is a, a theory promoted by Nkwazis in the 60s. It is relevant today. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting when you, you mentioned the 60s, 70s, 80s. I mean, of course, you and people like Zahid and Muyuddin and all these guys, you were all good friends at one time, right? And I think this goes back to... Uh, Baraj's question that it, it almost seems like there is a kind of a musical chair uh, uh, game be, uh, being played amongst uh, amongst oh well, essentially uh, uh, people of that generation who came through Amno probably in the seventies, eighties, uh, and nineties, and that it seems strange to some people that uh, a lot of you guys seem to be friends still, or at least reasonably um, on, on reasonably good. Uh, terms with each other, I think, I, and I'm, I, you know, I'm sure you could think of dozens of, of names. How does that play out when, you know, when you're in prison and your friend Najib and Zahid and and so on and so forth? Does that uh, is that difficult to cope with? Mark, there must be civility in politics, right? You disagree with me, I don't dump you to prison because you disagree with me. That is why we talk about rule of law. We have learned that lesson. I went through hell because of that. And we need to change that. You see, the fact that the moment you disagree with me or you are um, uh, in a different position, then you immediately treat you uh, that person as an enemy and dump the, the, the judiciary or the judicial process. Or And uh, this has to stop. That's what all what we're talking about, the reform agenda. This is one of my main criticism of an even uh, anti-corruption commission at that time. Yes, you were effective going through against the old uh, leaders, but you must be as effective, as um, competent uh, in in uh, ensuring that the uh, corrupt uh, practices stop and must end. And this is where I think um, a clear bold leadership. It's not a mission, it's a matter of age. I'm not defending myself as such. I mean, of course, I, I treat all as friends, but I will not, you know, use my power. Uh, to um, demonize people or to uh, put them in prison. It is not my, you must respect a due process and the rule of law, however, however long or difficult the process that may be. And this must be, this is a new normal that we want to talk about. Otherwise, yeah. we talk about this cliche of a new normal, we are, we are stuck by the still the old ancient regime.
<laughs> well, that was it. That I think what a lot of people were hoping for from Pakistan, and I guess you just didn't have time to do it, was serious institutional reform, uh, parliamentary accountability uh, rather than prime ministerial um, uh, edict, uh, right, um, when it comes to so many things. And I think uh, what was sad was that a lot of those potential reforms that would have made a difference, um, you, you can change the deck chairs on the ship, you can change the captain, but you know, unless you know, the ship's going in the right direction, you're going to hit the iceberg. And, and you, know, with, you know, with Malaysia, I think that whole issue of setting up um, parliamentary select committees, um, uh, of having MCA report to parliament rather than to the PM's department and so on, all of those things were absolutely necessary, but somehow didn't really happen. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, clearly there was, uh, there were um, uh, attempts and, and uh, programs uh, um, introduced, but um, I, I share with you, I mean, I share with you some of your concerns, and I, but I don't think we had that strong resolve to change, not only in terms of reform, in terms of institutions, but even economic policies. It's still, you know, the, the, the same old conglomerates, the cronies coming back, mm -hmm. creeping. I mean, so, so people become uh, easily disillusioned when yes, we no. talk about the form of, of distributive justice, of uh, propelling the economy at the same time, looking at the economic um, in, in a different way, in a more transparent way. Some of us did, and I think to be fair, in terms of financial um, uh, procedures, um, and management, but uh, at the same time, there are still flaws because we, the people are tied to the old archaic views. And people sometimes, uh, I have great difficulty, people tend to treat it personal, my difference with this man or that leader. I mean, to me, it's a matter of policy, it's not personal. I mean, if we, we fought for the last 21 years against corruption, abuse of power, uh, using the judiciary and the media, uh, to malign and demonize people, and this has to stop. And so, and we were against the people using the minister position to enrich themselves. Uh, I mean, all this. Um, I mean, I um, uh, I'm a bit cynical about this uh, so-called uh, uh, transparent manner of uh, declaring assets, etc. Because the institutions can actually probe and prove whether you're worth two billion or twenty million. Mm -hmm. or two million. So I think uh, that we will have to do. It is not late. I yeah. believe me. Uh, okay. I am still Inshallah. Con Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> um, it seems right. we know each other much better now. You have to let me a little bit get into the meat of the discussion a bit more in the last eight minutes or so that we have. Um, I think the mood of the people is they want results. And they wanted results 2018. They wanted results 2019. They want results 2020. It's really getting uh, intolerable. We look at what's happening in the world. We look back here. You cry a silent tear. You look out the world. You look back what's happening. You get disappointed, frustrated, and, and, and so on. So that is the mood of the people. Now, I completely sympathize with you that you had a very uphill battle. The entrenched mindsets, the, the, the institutions, the people, it was, it, it was massive to do in two years, massive to do. But I think what a lot of us are, are secretly hoping for is that if you come back after COVID, you are able to get the results that everybody knows we should get, that you are already you know, voicing out now. So we, 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 do you think that's possible? Do you think if you were to come back, all of the things that you've discussed today can be done in a reasonable period? And we're talking about 2020 really. Is, is that possible? I will certainly endeavor to do my best and I think um, if if uh, you have the right team, uh, the agenda is set, we should be able to do much more than what uh, we did. And the, and the, the country, uh, and more so the people, deserve better. Uh, because I think uh, post-COVID-19, in this new normal, is going to be a tremendous problem. Uh, we see maybe... Um, unprecedented, but still, uh, now that uh, we inherit this sort of system, the problem, we have to uh, really manage this crisis through strong leadership, effective yes. leadership, uh, yes. and clear, coherent policies. 
the three. The I, first I, thing you mentioned was if you had the right team. So can I pick you up on that? Do you have the right team? Are there new leaders coming up? Uh, I have a question here from Faisal. You know, we have seen amazing uh, results from Dr. Noor Hisham. Would you think that he has a, a part to play in the new normal? Do we have the right team for post-COVID? If we, if we we endeavor to do to seek change and and undertake the necessary reforms, I believe we can. I mean, uh, do, do, don't be stuck to the same old faces, then uh, and, and be prepared to 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 you know take uh, uh, this new young breed of people. I have problems. I mean, I'm not saying that we don't have problems. What is the problem essentially in Kandilan? Is when I decided to support uh, the participation of a set of new and younger leaders. So the old entrenched leadership rebelled against me. Uh, but I think uh, final analysis is proven. Those who rebelled were actually just craving for position and power. But now it is a new opportunity. We have a set of young leaders that I'm very confident. There's there are also young leaders in, in DAP and in Amana. And we, we should be able to negotiate among the you know, uh, top leadership to give uh, avenue to the young leaders to participate. Because the new normal requires a different resolve, different energy, different creativity. And this yes. is something that we need to work as a team. Thank you. Yes, so I think I can articulate that there is a strong and growing feeling of weariness, of fatigue that, uh, with the current leadership. I think there is a genuine craving for new faces and some old faces, actually. A lot of us who were in the Reformation movement, maybe, we were familiar with some faces, including Noroliza, including um, you know, some of the other leaders of DAP who took a lower role. And, uh, is, and I'm happy to hear that you are interested in doing it, but I, I think I'm reading out some of the comments here. Uh, a lot of people are missing, are uh, hoping for new faces. Yes, I share that sentiment clearly. And, and I think uh, the challenge, even within my party, um, to, to see after this uh, initial uh, uh, disciplinary moves, uh, getting rid of those uh, who have been uh, involved in such of the treacherous uh, move uh, acts, we should be able to revamp and uh, forge ahead with a new set of leaders, more credible and um, uh, willing to uh, uh, work harder uh, and 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 stuck to the major task of uh, affecting the reform programs and agenda. I can see that we're we sorry, Mark. Sorry, sorry, Mark. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So I think we've got a couple of minutes, uh, Barra. So I just wanted to ask um, uh, uh, Data Sri, finishing on a slightly uh, different note. Um, I think you've told us a great deal about where you and uh, and Pakistan stand um, vis-a-vis -vis the current situation. Um, uh, what kind of advice, you spent 10 years um, in prison, much of it in solitary, um, what advice do you uh, give to our uh, listeners on how to cope with uh, lockdown? <laughs> Brilliant. Read. This is an opportunity. I wouldn't be able to read all the classics and the entire works of Shakespeare and Boris Pasternak, Anna Akhmatova, Dickens, <laughs> All these classics and the new books, the entire works of Piketty in English and Stiglitz and Rawls, yeah. only in prison and <laughs> during the MCO. That's why I advise early on during the MCO, say, Aya, susah lah, you know, difficult, how to cope, boring lah. I mean, read and spend exactly. time. And, and in my case, of course, from 5 30 onwards, gardening. All right, okay. I'm doing the same house painting. <laughs> Uh, covered in paint. Uh, on that top, you mentioned Shakespeare, since we've got a minute left. Um, uh, King Lear's just come back onto the syllabus. I've got a bunch of students actually, we're doing that right now. And I've got a question from one of them uh, uh, saying that uh, King Lear, it, it's a play uh, where uh, an autocratic king gives away his power to the wrong uh, daughters uh, and uh, it, it leads to chaos. Um, uh, do you empathize with uh, Cordelia as a character? Um, and uh, <laughs> That play, of course, features a baddie called Edmund. Um, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if it was the same Edmund that we're all thinking of. Um, uh, which, which Shakespearean uh, work do you take the most uh, kind of comfort from? You know, King Lear is, of course, great work. You know, the last conversations that uh, King Lear had with Cordelia, something really penetrating and powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at this drama outside, that's right. uh, although it's a bit too late because he was uh, certainly very cruel and autocratic in his uh, years as a king. 
Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, uh, I once presented a paper to this conference of uh, scholars of Shakespeare, and I, so I was very humble. I said, look, I'm not qualified. I'm not... Uh, uh, but they say, no, 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 we want you to, to tell us about Shakespeare from the prism of prison cell. Ah. Um, and Juliet, of course. But then, uh, <laughs> then I said, yes, when I read Macbeth, and Lady Macbeth reminded me certain things. When, and then, of course... We, uh, we know who like, <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, King Lear, of course, and how he philosophized towards the end uh, about his, uh, you know, players, the, the, those uh, elite in power at that time. Um, what is quite, quite a number. I mean, in every single... This is a genius, I mean... Um, um, uh, uh, considered by Harold Bloom as what as the, the pillar of Western thought, and I would say even for the thought, uh, many Muslims disagree with me, uh, mm -hmm. including Muhammad Gaddafi, who considers that uh, cannot be, um, you know, Shakespeare must be a Muslim. Why? <laughs> He's a genius. <laughs> He's a genius. <laughs> yes, so, yes, yes. That's what But anyway, I would still. Um, I may continue even. Um, just recently, I was rereading Julius Caesar. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think a few lessons from Malaysian politics there as well. Uh, watch your back. Uh, yeah, is the, uh, is the message. Um, I, I can see the lights flashing, Datit Sri. We, we had an hour, so um, I don't know, um, uh, Bolraj, if you wanted to um, um, add anything, but I, I'd just like to say it was a delight. Uh, for you to uh, uh, come and talk to us. Thank you very much. And uh, slam up Babuka uh, and all that. And uh, stay safe and good luck. Uh, Baraj. That's really, thank you uh, for sharing your thoughts. I personally just wanted to share with you, I felt uh, you were a little bit wrong. You know, your tenacity over the years has been phenomenal. You've done the Nelson Mandela thing. You've gone to prison. You've come out. You're meant to get your, your, your spot as prime minister. You were meant to be uh, Prime Minister, you know, it's been a few times I think you were uh, allocated to be and we are some of us are wondering whether it's going to be now that that you, you finally get to step in. Uh, <laughs> I've had someone say to me, you know what his tenacity should be taught in schools, he should be taught as a Harvard case study, it should be bottled and sold in shops and stuff like that. <laughs> so uh, thank you for all of that. And thank you for sharing your thoughts today. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Back to Emma. Uh, we can let Emma back in. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, fascinating. And, you know, people complain about being under lockdown, but um, you, you've just gone to show that we, uh, we we could have had it worse. We could have been in prison to be able to do all, all these all this reading. Um, so, yeah, we, we should be thankful for that. Thank you very much for your um, insights and your frankness and for also responding to the questions that we, we got from our members. Thank you to our members who submitted questions. Um, sorry, we, there were so many we couldn't get through all of them. Uh, thank you to Mark and to Balraj. Um, if you would like to watch again, you can see it on the Oxford and Cambridge Society's oh, YouTube right. channel where um, there was a lot there, so I'm sure people want to watch it a second time to digest a lot of the insightful um, and frank things that you said to us. So um, thank you to Sean for um, keeping all the technical side going again. Um, and a final thank you to um, Data Sri for joining us today and for sharing your thoughts on this uh, tumultuous time that we are, are living in. And um, we hope to see you again in the new future next time. Don't leave it six years before you come back <laughs> to us. We hope to see you before six years again. And send, our, and send our regards to Neural. I will, I will. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.